our Parsha. Balatecha is going to be, we're actually going to just deal with one section or one verse in, in the text, Numbers, the eighth chapter. Um, and I want to focus on uh, some actually really appears to be minor thing within the text, but I really believe it'll be illuminating um, in just a moment. Rabbi, Rabbi Yosef uh, Salat uh, writes in his book that the sages wrote the purpose of the more menorah was to enhance the light of the Torah in Israel. Uh, that has many connotations, many thoughts. Hopefully during this class, we're going to bring down exactly what that means and how that same concept still exists in the world and it exists in, in the whole world, along with creation and other people of other nations. The menorah hints at the Torah, which is called uh, light, or uh, says Rabbi uh, Rabbeinu Bachya, the seven branches of the menorah represents the seven types of wis wisdom uh, and it teaches us that all wisdom has hewn out of its uh, is hewn out of its Torah as its source. All wisdom in the world, the menorah's complexity itself is a marvel, and as re as usually a menorah would be fashioned by first molding each of its parts on its own, and then you know welding them together, fastening them together. Well, the menorah, however, was, as we know, was hammered out of a single piece of gold and originated as a single object and remained a single object through the various stages of its construction and until it was a, a finished product. Let's break this down real quick. So just to review, the menorah has seven branches, 11 knobs, nine flowers, 22 goblets, uh, and is 17 hand breadths uh, weight. These numbers conceal many secrets in which, obviously, we're not going to be able to deal with them all today. I just hope to guide you to the, the what do you call it, the treasure chest of secrets so that you can begin to explore them, because this is going to be amazing. It says in this week's Parsha, quote, when you go to war against an enemy in your land, you shall sound the trumpets. Concerning this verse, the, the Shalah HaKodesh says that the enemy referred to here is actually the inclination, is the evil inclination. Like an invader, he is always trying to, uh, to nourish from your holiness and from holiness itself. Time and time again, he comes to do battle, and this battle should not be taken lying down. It's not something you should uh, let happen, but one must sound the trumpet. It's like uh, you've got to sound the alert, meaning we must arouse our neshama with great vigor when we realize that we're, we're coming under some type of influence from the evil inclination. Now, we could get into a whole, in, a whole class on examining what does, what does the... Um, uh, influence of the evil inclination look like, and it can be something as simple as uh, your arouse, uh, your desires are being aroused, or it could be as as uh, simple as someone at your job or your work saying something to you that triggers uh, a response that might not be the best response. This is the battlement that we take that takes place. This is the battle that has always been waged within the heart of man. This is the Amalek of every human being. Now, meaning this idea, one must be around their yashama, neshama. We must guard our neshama with a level of vigor. And this, this is indicated by the attention to detail on the treatment of the menorah. What I'm talking about is really defined best by the word kavanah, intent. You see this 
this performed mitzvah that was on the 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 in the temple, the menorah, had to be tended to with the utmost of perfection because at some level, in its physical form, was a physical representation of uh, a larger. Uh, mystical thing that says that the menorah represents the Torah and its effect in people's lives. That just as the this this one combined beaded form of a menorah represents that everything in the world, all of the consistency of the Torah is complete and perfect. Nothing can be added to it. Nothing should be taken away from it. It's perfect in all of its source. And the oil and the flame is the result of Torah itself. The sages mean this when we talk about kavanah or intent. When we say that if one's evil inclination revolts against him, it says to let him take it to the Beit Midrash, the place of learning. If this does not work, then he says to say the Shema and meditate on the names of God. And if this does not work, let him think the day of his death. Let him consider the time in which he will need to repent and return back to his previous form. So we have this quote again. When you go to war against your enemies or against an enemy in your land, it is the most sensible and simple sense, as there is no doubt that the Jewish people have enemies in the Holy Land now. I mean, it's obvious, especially in the last few months. It's become blatantly clear. Now, now that these enemies are a manifestation of our evil inclination, by this they are, they are given force. What does this mean? is that the enemies of our soul, the things that come in and buffet us and give us the most difficult time, is a result of the rumination of our evil inclination. Let me say that again. The things that come and buffet us and give us difficulties and hopefully drives us to tshuva is our yetzer. Our yetzer, how it's allowed to, to grow and manifest, will ultimately manifest in negative things happening to you. So the, the, the antidote for that is when the, the evil inclination that Yetzer begins to be stirred up, you've got to be vigorous about attacking it and driving it away. Uh, I'll give you a practical example. Just about every one of you have had this experience before. I actually had that this morning. I, I was sitting down, my wife is talking, and we're schmoozing about something. And I, I mentioned someone's name, and I, I said something in the process of the name that the way it was said, I just, I actually stopped and said, I hope that wasn't Lashon Hara, right? And, and then I said to myself, well, if I'm asking that, it's probably Lashon Hara, right? It's like, you're almost... The cat's out of the bag already. It's not, nothing you could really do about it. But the whole point is when we have those moments, we need to ask ourselves, what was deep down in my kavanah, my intent? What was the oil like deep down in that menorah of my life? That when it bubbled up, light didn't come, but dark. I mean, we should be asking ourselves those questions. So let's look at this. We know that the enemies are a manifestation of our evil inclination. And the Torah, they, the, the, uh, it says in our, in our Parsha, I'm sorry, uh, is probably the most unusual verse in the, in the whole Torah itself. They are surrounded by two inverted noon. Now, all of uh, you guys who are Hebrew uh, learners and students and scholars, bear me uh, the kindness to go through and explain this for everyone else. The idea is that the noon on each side of that verse is uh, inverted noons. And there's actually nothing like this anywhere else in the whole of the Tanakh. And the interesting thing about these noons is that nobody really knows. There are some speculations within the realms of Torah, but today we'll examine a couple of things that might be the case. No one really knows 
where they ought to be. No one really knows what are they doing there anyway, and yet they exist in the Torah scroll, prescribed as part of the Sefer Torah. These two verses are enclosed with a long space, then an inverted noon, and then another long space, and on the other end, two noon can be written not only backwards, but upside down, facing front, looking back over the shoulders, reversed, inverted, inversed, or in disarray. There, there are many scribal rules about these spaces and letters, and to this is no actual universal agreement. Of course, you're thinking, way to go, Rod. You're going to bring up a subject that we don't have an agreement on or no one has an opinion. But I'm going somewhere with this. Watch it. Where does the idea of adding these scribal arrangements come from? We would all assume that Moshe Rabbeinu atop Mount Sinai was dictated this by the Holy One. And since we are forbidden to add to or subtract or take away from the Torah, then... uh, that has remained in there. The Torah states this in Deuteronomy 13, 1, uh, all this word which I've commanded you that you will observe and to do and uh, not add to it nor diminish from it. If not, the only other explanation is plausible is that the, the rabbis instituted this following God's commandment to, quote, build a fence around Torah laws. The inverted noon surrounded these verse looks more like uh, a fence. It's like a guard. It's pr- almost like parentheses. Now, surrounding the letters of the value, other verses for the two inverted noon uh, is because every single letter of these two verses was dotted, causing a particular problematic result, a difficulty to lay out, to write, and to read. This would mean that God's name would be dotted, and that's impossible. So traditionally indicates that the erasing of a letter which is dotted, this would mean that God's name would be dotted, and if it was possible, it could be be like erasing the letters of the Holy One, blessed be He. So dotting all the words could not actually be done, but it was alluded to by noon around the verses, Nikud, uh, point for this reason, are the two inverted noon. When, quote, the ark went forth, Moses said, quote, arise, O God, and scatter your enemies. Let your feast flow before you, flee before you. When it came to the rest, he said, quote, return, O God, the myriads of Israel's thousands. The first verse was 12 words, like the last verse of the Torah, and the second, uh, the second verses has seven words like the first verse of the Torah. Rabbi Yehuda Nasi said about Bidmid Bar 10, 35 through 36, he he ranks it as a separate book in the Torah. It says, the Talmud says that this section, God placed symbols above and below because it ranks itself as a significant book into itself. Uh, I find this interesting. Talmud uh, uh, Shabbat 115b says that, and thus this renders the Torah to seven books. One, Genesis 2, Exodus, Leviticus 4, the beginning of the book of Numbers, up to these two verses, five, then these two verses, six, and the rest of the book of Numbers, seven. Well, we've learned something new today. Now, these two verses consist of 85 letters. The sages tell us that these two verses enclosed by the inverted noons can be separate, uh, can be actually a separate book of the Torah as a sefer. The book must be at least 85 letters long. The division of the Torah is seven books, which will not be revealed until Mashiach arrives. 85 equals mouth. When the mouth is used for kadusha holiness, this creates a force, a flow of kadusha in this person focuses him on spiritual fulfillment. By learning Torah, speaking it out loud, speaking it with a forceful voice, declaring it as we do five times a week in our classes and more in our personal life, the words of the Torah are the word of God. It is the very projection of the 
secret code of Hashem itself in creation. Concerning this verse, it is written in the Emek HaMelech that, quote, whoever reads these words daily with proper kavanah or intention will not be hurt, even when they may travel to a place of thieves or be at sea in another dangerous location. Now, we actually say these verses every time uh, the Torah is taken out of the ark. If you go into a synagogue and when the Torah is taken out of the ark, these words are uttered. By these our enemies are scattered and foes flee. Recall the biblical times the ark was led by the forces of Israel into combat. Torah is amazing. The, the, the Rebbe Rash, uh, Rashab teaches that the two upside down noon are brackets that combine to create a square that looks like, uh, you know, looks like brackets, as I said, and is known to be the Mikublim uh, that the Sifrot calls Yosher or supernatural. Enter the, the sephrot of nature, the circular sephrot at the end of the kav through the square. Then all of Israel, as 12 tribes come together as one and connect to the Torah, Mashiach will be revealed. Now, we've said this. We've heard it from Rabbi uh, uh, Wobi last week talking about the signs of Mashiach and what to expect is that when the world begins to change its mentality and its intention, its kavanah, Mashiach is going to be revealed. The two inverted noons will drop, and the light of the Holy Ark will spread through the whole seven books of the Torah. The, the words, uh, the, the, the 19, which would be 12 plus seven words, will bring together the beginning and end of the Torah. Think about this for a second. When Mashiach comes, or when the full understanding revelation of knowledge comes, this Will these noons will fall off and the light of Torah will come through, or the light of knowledge and understanding will come through all the Torah, and it will it's the same light, uh, the circle of uh light that that really awaits us from the day of creation, it's waiting for all of humanity to be re sort of returned to the to Gan Eden. This will be enough for those who understand. When the ark will travel alludes to the divine light's journey to earth and its journey throughout earth. The ark in Hebrew is called what? Oran, which consists of the letter O, light, and noon. By this, we come well prepared to face all of our adversaries. As with us, the light of the ark leading the way, giving us power to scatter the enemies and cause all the foes to flee by a light that comes between the brackets of the noons in the text. The Chida, in his book, Nechal uh, Kedumim, the letter noon were chosen to box in these two verses is because the teachings contained wherein are the 50th highest gate of understanding. Which is hinted to by the numerical value of the noon, which is 50. The Chida writes that now we have only 85 letters left in these two verses, alluding to there used to be more letters in the Sefer. Now, it's interesting. It says that there are more 600,000 letters in a Torah scroll. <clears throat> One counts the letters, and you have 304,805. It must be that 295,195 other letters were written or hidden in the book between the noon. A midrash explains a book called the Prophecy of Ildad and Midad. We remember this. They prophesied. And it says that was suppressed by these two verses, uh, but uh, were suppressed. Only these two verses that we quote remain of it, and that is why they are marked by inverted noon. Now, in the Septuagint, uh, second century, uh, the Torah was translated into Greek. Now, they, they didn't translate the two verses uh, where they are today. Rather, they actually moved in the Septuagint, uh, moved the verses 35 and 6 to be before 34. And this partiot, from this point on, the two upside-down noon are different than those preceding 
these upcoming Parsha in <coughs> sorry. <coughs> sorry about that. <clears throat> Rabbi Gamliel taught that this section, when Mashiach comes, will be removed here and written in a rightful place. Its rightful place is in the chapter where the banners of the tribes are actually listed. This seems to be involved with the teaching of our sages that the stories in the Torah are not always arranged in chronological order, which makes the Torah even more mysterious and beautiful, and, and uh, it contains hidden secrets. As it is taught by Elijah, the prophet, and Tanya, uh, Deb Eliyahu, that to prevent the evil inclination from gaining a foothold, like Aaron, uh, the Aaron Hakohen would, and one should daily light the menorah so that it was always burn, burning. Does that mean you need to literally have a menorah in your house and you light it? Well, no, the high coin Gadol for sure did that. As the menorah has seven openings, so you have seven openings in your head. Some say that I have probably more because I've had my dad tell me I had holes in my head. <laughs> so we are found seven openings in our head, right? What are what are the eyes, ears? Can you list the rest? <laughs> First of all, we say, let's deal with the eyes, the two eyes. We must prevent vision from leading us astray. We've got to be careful that our eyes don't perceive an illusion that's not there, an illusion that we're something that we're not when we should be very truthful to us. Our eyes are conduits of chokhmah, divine wisdom and creation and inspiration. Let all one's inspiration be led to holiness. And likewise, one's ears shouldn't listen to evil. The ears are conduits of divine understanding. Let all one's understand to be found in the Torah. The nose is a sense by which Mashiach, Messiah, will discern the judgment of people and who they are. It is a conduit for uh, divine knowledge. Let one know before they proceed that they will do and will be holy if they perceive by their openings, their mouth, their ears. While the mouth should be used to, to speak words of Torah and prayer, not lush and horror, evil speech. So we see that these seven openings are openings that we can uh, perform mitzvah. And if we do that, the enemy literally will flee. You know, the, the, the mouth is a conduit of Malkut, and let it be that all of one's actions drive him closer to holiness and to governance of the Holy One, blessed be he, and not to its evil inclination. If one guards these portals, the eyes, the ears, the mouth, the nose, we will not nourish the evil inclination, and it will not come to stay with them. When one is doing mitzvahs, it will, it will have less strength to interfere. Like during tefillah or prayer, the evil inclination is, will not interfere with their thoughts to distract them, his mind from being in divine contemplation. Now, I know that with myself in prayer, uh, it's difficult to have the proper intent because your mind happens to scatter but it's easy to refocus if you, if you really try. Um, the idea, though, is to reframe your covenant, your intent. By following such instructions, we will win our battle against the Yetzirah and evil inclination. The Yetzirah will have no way to actually gain any power over us. Evil will have no way to gain nourishment. Then there will be yielded from the mitzvot that will all be done in purity and great kavanah and with a great degree of light and ultimately heralding in this great shofar and the sound of the righteousness of Hashem being illuminated into the world in the days of Mashiach when evil shall finally be defeated. So when you go to battle with your evil inclination, remember it is important to guard your heart, your mind, your eyes, your ears, guard your mitzvahs, and evil will flee from you. So we will continue on in our Q&A session now. 
who will be first? Comments, questions, fears, doubts, unbeliefs, 